Okay. Select audience this morning, if they're audiencing. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to be talking about viral zoonoses for the next two lectures. And <clears throat> uh, today, so viral zoonoses are virus diseases that we tend to get from creatures rather than from other humans. So that's the origin of that. And there are those that are transmissible via arthropods, i.e. blood-sucking insects and ticks, um, and those that we get from exposure to vertebrate animals, um, which and then they're normally transmitted by bites or body fluids or inhalation of various nasty things, whatever. Um, so we'll talk about those uh, on Friday, but today I'm going to be talking about those that we get from uh, the arthropods. So these are the so-called Arbo viruses, the arthropod born, AR from arthropod, BO from born. Okay, that's what. So the transmission of these is that we normally get them from blood-sucking vectors. Not always mosquitoes. You can include sand flies, um, other blood-sucking insects, ticks. Um, so we're talking about arthropods. Uh, but mosquitoes probably account for the vast majority of them. And there are hundreds of these diseases worldwide. So I, don't, I can't talk to you about hundreds of them. So what I want to do is, to some extent, talk more from a public health um, surveillance point of view, uh, because I, as I hope you'll see that becomes an important part of the public health response, and to make you aware of some of the things that are involved in these and, and aware of some of the ones that you're most likely to meet in the U.S., uh, but if you travel worldwide, uh, there are huge numbers of uh, cases caused by many of these viruses, and you need to be aware of what are risk factors and what you can vaccinate against uh, for world travelers. Okay, so transmission, as we say, is normally from the arthropod. And normally the arthropod gets the virus by sucking uh, a meal of blood. So to, do, to get the virus, uh, the sucky or whatever, has to have a viremia so that when the virus takes in the blood, gets a significant number of virus particles enough to establish an infection. And the virus normally doesn't cause the mosquitoes any problem. They don't go around with headaches or retroviral pain or anything. Um, they fly around quite happily, uh, but it usually spreads to the salivary glands uh, and replicates in the salivary glands so that next time they bite you, you get it from their saliva. Okay. And the way that most of these diseases are controlled is by vigilance, because for the vast majority of these, we have no treatment, um, we have uh, no vaccine, uh, and so it, it, awareness and a public health response are the major ways that these are kept as low as they are in this country, um, and in other countries where there's a good public health response, but uh, where you can't get a good public health response because of problems of informing people about what's going on, plus other things like access to uh, preventative measures, then they can be really get going. And talking about getting going, um, one of the things to remember about these viruses these days in particular is, you know, here's this guy chatting up a woman in a bar and he says, say you're from France, wow, you've got lovely eyes. And down here the viruses are saying, hey everyone, we're going to Paris. Uh, and that's something to remember. People can pick up these viruses and they can be halfway around the world uh, within a very short time. So it becomes very important about who's infectious. Is the person with the virus who's got the disease infectious or, or is it just uh, is it other things? And, and we'll go into that in a minute. But this is something to remember with all of these viral diseases and many of these other diseases as well, um, that the world is getting smaller and smaller and it's easier and easier for these things to travel worldwide. Okay, so as I say, today we're focusing on these um, arbovirus diseases, and they, there's a vast range of them, and as I say, with hundreds of these diseases, um, I'm trying to make some overall generalizations. Um, but the ones that really concern us from the point of view of serious human illness um, are the, the ones that cause encephalitis, um, febrile diseases, uh, and the hemorrhagic fever. So these viruses, typically many of them just cause a fever and you normally recover from that and it's not pleasant at the time, but you recover. 
Uh, but in some cases, uh, these viruses can spread to the brain and cause encephalitis or meningitis. Uh, and in other cases, um, you can get these hemorrhagic fevers, which can be very serious. So the thing to do is to try and remember which of the ones do what. But some of the ones that usually cause febrile diseases may occasionally cause an encephalitis they're not normally regarded as encephalitic viruses, but they can occasionally do it. So these um, are not hard and fast uh, distinctions. So the families that I'm really going to be focusing on, which cover the vast majority of these infections, are the toga viruses and the flavi viruses. Uh, these are enveloped, shrink-wrapped icosahedral nuclear capsids. And you've already met one member of the toga virus family, uh, and that was... Um, Rubella, which is a shrink wrapped. It's one of the few that is transmitted from one human to an another. It's in a separate genus. But most members of the toga viruses are transmitted by arthropods. Um, and another shrink wrapped icosahedral virus, uh, it, uh, uh, the family, are uh, the flavi viruses, the yellow fever viruses. Flavi means yellow, that's where that one comes from. Uh, but you've already met one of these in hepatitis C, which is a member of this family. So these are envelope viruses, and uh, <coughs> they are apparently, um, as I say, the, most of the, the members of these families are transmitted by biting insects or by um, direct contact. The, the rubella is unusual in that it's transmitted by the respiratory rate. And we're also going to be talking about members of the bunya virus. These have got segmented helical nuclear capsids, their negative strand. Um, and they have envelopes as well. And then finally, kind of the odd one out because it's not uh, enveloped, um, there's one member of the Rio virus family, uh, and I'm going to just briefly mention that. It, uh, Rio viruses really don't play a major role in these kind of diseases, but I'm just going to briefly mention this. But one thing to notice at the moment that all of these are RNA viruses. Okay, so. As I say, the transmission cycles um, are important, very important from the point of view of minimizing human disease. And we're all going to be very selfish and talk about human disease and very much talk about these from the human point of view at the moment. Um, the vectors are some kind of arthropod, frequently insects, uh, frequently from the mosquito family. Uh, and they trans the virus, as I say, will usually replicates in the saliva, uh, salivary glands, and so it's transmitted when they bite. Many of these insects actually inject a bit of saliva into the bite um, to either stop blood clotting because they don't want their proboscis to get blocked up with blood, uh, or, uh, and or uh, sometimes a local anesthetic so that you don't swat them because you don't realize you're being bitten. So they frequently inject saliva, and along with that goes whatever else is in the saliva. Uh, they can then transmit it to vertebrate hosts. The vertebrate hosts uh, are usually called the reservoir. Uh, we regard the mosquitoes as the vectors because they're what give it to us. Uh, the vertebrate hosts are reservoirs. We may be reservoirs for some of this, these viruses, and I'll go into that in a minute. Um, so the virus replicates in the, ver the vertebrate hosts, causes a viremia. The host is bitten by a mosquito, uh, and the whole cycle keeps going. So that's the sort of usual cycle for these virus viruses. And occasionally, though, um, the virus may bite what's called a dead-end host. This doesn't mean that it's going to kill you. Uh, but what it means is that when the virus gets into these dead-end hosts, it doesn't create enough. There, there will be probably a viremia. There will almost certainly be a viremia in some cases. Uh, but uh, you don't get enough of a viremia to infect another mosquito with any significant degree of success. Uh, so once the virus gets into the dead-end hosts, uh, they don't really participate in, in the cycle of that virus. They're, they're just basically it's a dead-end as far as the virus is concerned. It, it's not going to be able to get from here into other mosquitoes and then onwards. So that's the definition of, of a dead-end host. Obviously, this means that anything which affects mosquitoes, such as food space or the resources and predators, parasites, the weather, uh, will affect this part of the cycle. Anything which affects the vertebrate hosts, which include predators and parasites, food space and resources, um, and maybe weather and climate will affect this part of the cycle. 
and in addition to which in the vertebrate host the immune status will also affect the, the cycle. So you have all of these factors that affect the cycle and if you can interfere with these at any stage you can reduce the impact on disease. So when you want to look at these things, there's all sorts of things you have to consider, and this becomes quite a fascinating public health problem, although you're probably not into fascinating public health problems with an exam looming. Uh, but um, from the point of view of the arthropods that we, uh, we're interested in, we're interested in where do they live. I mean, obviously, if they live in somewhere that we never visit, we don't really care about what they've got. Um, their diurnal activity, uh, there are thousands of species of mosquitoes worldwide. Um, there's something like 150 species in this country. Some viruses are spread by some and not by others. So you need to know for a particular disease what kind, what, which mosquito is spreading it. Is that mosquito active in the evening? Is it active all day? Um, is, it only, is it only found in, in remote rural areas and it's difficult to come across? Or does it love to live in your yard and your house and you're going to come across it all the time? So knowing the habits of these mosquitoes can cause the public health people to suggest, you know, maybe you don't have an evening football match, maybe you have an afternoon one, so that the major mosquito that might be transmitting this disease is not so active. Uh, in other cases, you can't do much about it. Um, some of these have got preferred hosts. So some mosquitoes may be carrying the disease perfectly well, uh, but they would rather do anything than bite a human. I mean, that's definitely on their list of, of bad meals. Uh, but if they're desperate, they'll bite a human. Um, others, um, they have a preferred um, environment and normally they're not flying around and they'll just be resting quietly. So many female mosquitoes are couch potatoes during the day. They just sit around on a leaf or something. But if you go up to them and disturb them by pushing through an area where they're just, they, they will say, well, you know, there's a meal here. Why don't I take it? And they'll do it. So you, you the... This kind of thing of knowing about the kind of life of the mosquitoes has turned out to be remarkably uh, significant in controlling these. And also, how easily does the virus overwinter? Uh, most mosquitoes, at least in this area of the world, do not overwinter as adults. They overwinter as eggs, as a rule. Um, so if the virus can get into the egg, it can survive the winter in the egg. Uh, but if it's only carried in the adults, uh, then it will die off with the adults and it will rely on the vertebrate uh, reservoir to overwinter. So how the virus overwinters can affect how quickly it, it gets into the insect population in the following year, because obviously it can't start getting in. If it, doesn't, if it overwinters in a vertebrate host, it won't start getting into that population until there's been time for, for the vertebrate host to infect the mosquitoes and get the life going. So it can affect some of the things. It can also affect how you stop transmission of this, because if it can be transmitted by eggs, eggs can contaminate a huge number of things that you import from one country to another. Mosquitoes can also contaminate them, but they're easier to deal with. Hidden mosquito eggs can be a, a, a significant problem. In the vertebrate, uh, obviously the migratory activity of the vertebrate can be really important because uh, we might fly by planes, but many of these vertebrates uh, migrate by flying around the country or, or just by walking. Um, and the persistence of viremia, if there's a high viremia for a long time, that reservoir is going to be much more efficient in transmitting the virus. And the clinical consequences, because if the virus causes death very rapidly, then the reservoir may be able to transmit for a short time, but it's not going to be able to uh, overwinter maybe or something like that. So the clinical consequences can, can determine which members of the reservoir group are most effective in maintaining this virus long term. Uh, and also you have the question, is it, if it infects a particular animal, is it the animal acting as a reservoir or a dead end host? Uh, because this has major impact and you'll see some of that in a minute. Prevention is surveillance. And this is where um, physicians are, are really important because they're going to see cases if they realize that some of this stuff is going on then there can be a rapid public health response. Uh, so the surveillance out in the community is really important. And since these infect many, very often vertebrate animals that are of veterinary importance, veterinarians are an important part of this surveillance network as well. Uh, 
so prevention is surveillance so that you can put in things like vector control, um, warning the public about the need to be super careful about these things. The use of uh, repellents, um, protective clothing, you cover yourself up so you're not uh, bitten, timing of activity or cancellation of activities, um, and the vaccine if available, but very few. Uh, there are very few vaccines available for these. Since you've got hundreds of diseases, there's, there's a the number of vaccines, I think, come on one hand as far as humans are concerned. And prevention also requires knowing something about these mosquitoes. So many of these mosquitoes um, that are transmitting some of the diseases that we're particularly concerned about uh, turn out to love, in, love your yard, your patio, um, because they like things like small containers of relatively clean water. So these kind of things where people collect rainwater accidentally or on purpose uh, can be really a major source of some of, some of these uh, mosquitoes. Others like to grow out in big, to be in trees or in big swamps and things like this. Uh, and they're not so much likely to be in your backyard unless you've got lots of trees and big swamps in your backyard. But uh, these kind of things, public health is there saying, please empty these containers. So when you have outbreaks of some of these, one of the responses is to get people to empty all these kind of containers. Uh, one idea why some of these viruses are taking off so much is the advent of disposable plastic containers. Because some of these love things like Coke bottles and, and uh, things like this that are just thrown out uh, and get some water in and their ideal protective environment for these breeding. Um, at one stage I remember whenever there was an outbreak of St. Louis encephalitis, CDC used to ask people to go around the graveyards and empty all those little vase things that are at the head of tombstones. Uh, they're an ideal breeding place. So you need to know the breeding places for the problem that you've got. And that's largely done by the, the public health people at DHEC and so on and so forth. But uh, it's, <coughs> it's part of how you deal with these things because we, otherwise we have really very few ways to deal with them. So I talked about their life cycles, and there's a terminology which is still used, the sylvatic, sylvus means woods, or the jungle um, life cycle. And this is kind of the cycle in the wild, as opposed to in direct contact with humans. And that's where the virus infects the arthropod, it bites the vertebrate, there's a viremia, another arthropod bites the ver vertebrate, it gets infected, and then it infects another vertebrate, and it just goes round between the arthropod and the animal reservoir uh, without normally going into humans at all. And this is its regular cycle, but occasionally the arthropod might bite a human either because the humans invaded the arthropod's area or because, or vice versa. And usually in this, uh, in this kind of cycle, the human is a dead end host. So the human can get disease, but there's not sufficient viremia that the arthropod will be, it will be able to, the human will be able to affect it any significant number of arthropods. That's contrasted with the urban cycle. Uh, and in the urban cycle, the arthropod uh, gets infected, bites a human, the human gets infected, the human gets a significant viremia. So when a mosquito bites that human, then the arthropod gets infected, it can infect in another human. So you can have this entirely in the human cycle. So the answer of just getting rid of the animal reservoir it certainly doesn't apply in this case, folks. Uh, so here, when you've got the human as part of the cycle, then you need to be aware that one thing is that the humans can introduce, humans coming from an infected country carrying the virus can introduce the virus into a country where this virus doesn't currently exist. Um, and also, you need to be aware that if you have a human who's got a viremia, um, then things like screening, keeping them indoors, uh, can actually interrupt this transmission cycle. So it, it has an effect on the transmission cycle. If the human is a dead-end host, then it, that human is no risk factor for it causing this disease to get established in whatever country they went to after they got it. Uh, but if the human is part of the cycle, then that's different. So many viruses have got a wild, urban jungle, uh, I mean, have got a sylvatic jungle cycle and an urban cycle. But some viruses have got very efficient urban cycles, uh, and some viruses are predominantly um, the, jungle, the jungle sylvatic type. 
So not surprisingly, in view of the idea that these are transmitted by arthropods, uh, the outbreaks you tend to see in the summer or the early fall because it, uh, you have to wait for the insects to get active, for them to get infected, for this whole cycle to get going. They tend to be sporadic. Uh, it very much depends on the dynamics of the reservoir and the insect and people and what kind of summer it is and a whole pile of factors that are not understood. So the epidemiology people have major problems predicting where these are going to go because it's very difficult to discern any rules that you can use usefully apply. So they're, to they're fairly unpredictable. Uh, and as I said, many different viruses cause the disease. One thing that's typical of most of these viruses is that the infections are often subclinical. So usually many more people are infected than actually come down with clinical symptoms. And again, as, as a generalization, the initial viral replication with these viruses, remember, they get into the bloodstream. Uh, so it's not surprising that they like to go for the endothelial cells. That's going to be the first type of cell they meet as a rule. And they also um, tend to frequently replicate in cells of the macrophage monocyte lineage. Uh, and that's sort of unusual because most, as I talked about the intrinsic antiviral activity of macrophages and monocytes. So usually these don't, viruses don't replicate terribly well in macrophages and monocytes. But in this case, for many of these viruses, they do. And I said these are RNA viruses, so it's not surprising that they tend to be very good inducers of interferon. So many of the diseases that you see in the early stages of infection are due to interferon induction. Headache, myalgia, retroorthral pain, fever. <coughs> and in order, it, they, they nearly all cause a viremia. They're replicating in the endothelial cells, so they're spilling out into the bloodstream. Um, as I say, the question is how much of a viremia is it enough for a mosquito to get infected determines whether or not you're a dead end host or not, but you still get the viremia. So the recovery, interferon probably plays an important role in initial um, trying to damp down the infection. Um, but probably the major thing in, in recovery is cell-mediated immunity. Uh, but antibody may play a role because what, tends, what happens frequently in these is you get an initial infection and you get an initial viremia where these grow in macrophages and, and in endothelial cells. And then a week, 10 days later, somewhere in that kind of time period, that initial round of virus replication comes to its peak and you release a lot of this virus into the bloodstream. So you, your major of viremia is like 10 days um, or more, but around, say a week, 10 days, somewhere around there, after the initial infection. Now, if you have raised an antibody response, a neutralizing antibody to risk response during that period, then when it spills out into the blood in this big wave, you've got a lot of neutralizing antibodies and you can neutralize the virus. If the virus wins the race and you haven't made enough neutralizing antibody, then it can spill out and spill and get all around the body and really spread rapidly. So one of the things that seems to play an important role is how long, how rapidly do you develop neutralizing antibody versus how rapidly does the virus replicate? And that probably explains why so many people just get those original typical flu-like symptoms because that's the interferon, that's an immediate response. Uh, and you get those flu-like symptoms, but you don't get the the bad consequences due to the spread through the rest of the body, encephalitis, etc., via the viremia. Uh, so this race between your antibody and the virus probably affects how many people go down with more severe disease uh, versus how many don't, along with many other factors. So cell-mediated immunity is probably really important in clearing the virus from those originally infected cells. Uh, but in terms of spread, because it takes so long to get the, this true vir the, the second viremic phase, the major viremic phase, um, if you're lucky, uh, you may have neutralizing antibody. So that it can actually be important during the disease process in limiting the spread of it. Diagnosis, well, as I said, there are hundreds of these, so they've all got individual ways to diagnose. Um, but uh, it's usually done in specialized labs. Uh, and 
the commercial labs now, because of its importance, do testing for West Nile virus and for a few of these other viruses. Uh, but more usually, it's done in state labs or CDC. Um, the standard immunological techniques, I don't need to go into them, I don't think, and it's going to be different for every virus, and, and uh, these techniques are being uh, rapidly developed, so there's no point in discussing them much for each individual virus. Uh, and PCR is coming to the fore, because PCR being nucleic acid-based, uh, it's much easier to just adapt an assay for each individual virus, because all you've got to do is sequence it, and then you can start coming up with targets for PCR. Uh, which is much easier than developing specific immune uh, techniques by and large. Uh, so the PCR is coming to the forefront. And resistance, the important thing in being resistant to this virus is IgG, because this is, these viruses are transmitted into the bloodstream, so mucosal immunity doesn't play any role in this. So it's IgG which is protective. Okay. So... Are there any questions on any of that? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on a few of these um, which I think you uh, should know about. And as I say, I've chosen some of these because of their uh, impact in this country. Uh, but remember that there are many of these viruses worldwide. And uh, so we're going to talk about viruses, start off by talking viruses that cause encephalitis. Uh, members of the toga virus, eastern equine encephalitis is the most important of these currently. Um, Western equine encephalitis we'll mention, and I'm just briefly going to mention Venezuelan. Um, you needn't, I'm not going to quiz you on Venezuelan. But um, Flavy viruses, um, the most important at the moment is West Nile, uh, but there's also St. Louis encephalitis. And then I'm just briefly going to mention um, the Bunya viruses. Okay, so we're talking about encephalitis now. So the, the viruses I'm going to be talking about here are the ones that the major serious clinical symptom is encephalitis. And we can, a lot of this is what I've already said. You see sporadic infections. You may have a huge number one year and then you may not see it for years. Uh, or it may be lingering along 20, 30 cases every year and then suddenly you don't see it and you've no idea why you don't see it anymore. Um, usually with most of these viruses that I'm going to talk about, or well, with all the ones I'm going to talk about today, um, there's a very low percent of infections which cause clinical cases. So very few people who are infected even realize that they've been infected. If they had any symptoms, it didn't sort of register. So they certainly don't go to see a physician. Um, and even if they do get clinical case, um, they don't always get major disease. The clinical case may be no more than a fever, flu-type symptoms. Uh, but the, one of the problems is if you get major disease, the encephalitis can be very serious. Uh, these diseases are probably all underdiagnosed because if somebody comes with a nonspecific flu-like symptom, uh, as Dr. Narian has pointed out, many of these you just never get around uh, to knowing what caused them. So these will go into that big pool of flu-like symptoms that we don't really know what caused them. So many of them may be much more common than you realize. Okay, so the first one I'm going to talk about in, is the toga virus, shrink wrap dicosahedral RNA virus, positive strand. Uh, and it predominantly occurs, its name is actually accurate. At the moment, it predominantly occurs uh, in the eastern uh, states. Uh, and its reservoir is birds. So birds, of course, are pretty mobile, so it's easy for it to spread. The vector of is the mosquito, as it is with most of these. Um, the, now, we have something we call sentinel animals. Uh, and sentinel animals are animals that uh, are susceptible to the virus and that, usually, and that show signs of the disease. Now, very often, the natural reservoirs show little of any sign of disease. Occasionally, sometimes they may, but usually the natural reservoirs are, are relatively resistant to the disease and they can carry it for years and, and not seem to have any negative effects. Uh, but the sentinel animals are those which do show symptoms of disease. And from our point of view, the important sentinels are those that we are familiar with as a rule. And so one thing is I said about veterinarians, the sentinel animals here are, are horse, quail, turkey. 
Um, they all come down with sickness due to eastern equine encephalitis. It was called equine because of the effects on the horse, but in fact the horse is a dead-end host for this. So the horse is not a part of the transmission cycle. But if we have outbreaks of this virus in the horse, the quail, or the turkey, we know we've got it circulating in the mosquito population. And so when we see that kind of thing, uh, the, the veterinarians are part, as I say, of the surveillance network, uh, and immediately there is a public health response to warn people about taking appropriate precautions to avoid insect bites, um, spray programs may be put into place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we have outbreaks of equine encephalitis uh, much more frequently than human encephalitis in the state, uh, and it's uh, <coughs> so. The, for humans, um, the at-risk population are the, very, are the young, under 15 years or so, and the older people, over 50 years or so. And I don't think we exactly have a reason for either of those. But the case fatality for eastern equine cyphalitis can be very high, so that's why there's such a strong public health response if it's realized that it's there. And that's also why you see so few cases, because as soon as people realize that it's out there, uh, there tends to be a very rapid response by the public health authority. Uh, and on average, uh, over, it was something like 30 years, uh, there was an average of five cases a year, but this year there's been an outbreak up in New England, and I, it's somewhere about 10 or 12 cases, if I remember. Uh, but there's been a very strong public health response. So your hope is that if that public health response has prevented a lot of other cases. So these are all reportable diseases. Um, and here's a situation, just to point out that we get it here. Um, but here, um, one, a, a woman in Lexington County, a woman in Bamberg County, uh, an elderly Lexington County woman and a five-year-old from Bamberg are the first people to die of eastern equine encephalitis in South Carolina since 1990. This was 2003. So this is the typical prob problems here, the elderly and the young. So uh, you wouldn't, be, you know, other people can be infected and get encephalitis, but more usually you see it in the elderly and the young. And again, in this case, there was a strong public health response. Western equine encephalitis is caused by a very closely related toga virus. Uh, similar birds to the mosquito, similar sentinels. Children are at higher risk for this one. Um, and it has a much lower case fatality rate. So it doesn't have the seriousness of the equine encephalitis, but it's still serious. I mean, you don't want this kind of case fatality rate. So these are, these are the number of clinically detected cases. So as I say, there's a huge number of subclinical cases that you, you never know about. And we haven't had any recent cases of, of uh, Western equine encephalitis. Um, there used to be an average of somewhere around 20 cases a year, and we just haven't seen it for years now. No idea why not. Now, I was just going to mention here, for the sake of you of tying these things together, there's also something called Venezuelan equine encephalitis, which can infect man. It's a pretty mild disease. Uh, but here, the reservoir is not the bird. It's the horse. So one thing is that when there's an outbreak of Venezuelan encephalitis, then you are concerned about horses being part of the transmission cycle and it periodically spills over into Texas from Mexico. There's quite a bit of it around in Mexico. And periodically it spills over into the US and then you have to stop all horse movement, etc., to try and keep these things local because the horse is part of the transmission cycle. So this is where it, you wouldn't bother to... That is not necessarily in, say, South Carolina because the horse is not part of cycle for eastern equine encephalitis, but for western it is. So as I say, I'm not going to quiz you on that. I don't know where the boards care. But, uh. West Nile virus is the most significant of these encephalitis viruses. And currently we're having thousands of cases a year, way more arbovirus disease than we've seen with all the other arboviruses together uh, in past years. So West Nile has completely changed the face of the amount of illness due to arboviruses in this country. Um, the vector is the mosquito again, and the reservoir are birds. Uh, although animals, other animals can be infected, usually as dead-end infections. So again, horses are susceptible to it. There's actually a vaccine for horses. Um, 
So usually birds to mosquitoes, and again, we are a dead-end host, uh, much like the horses. This is just to show how a virus can spread. So again, don't learn this, but this virus first appeared in 1999 in the New York area, uh, and in all of these, the darker color indicates human infections, and the paler color indicates where there were infected mosquitoes. But if you look at 99, 2000, not much spread. People are saying, oh, well, maybe it's going to be okay. 2001, it's beginning to spread. And then 2002, it's virtually all over the country. By 2003, it's everywhere. So in four years, it's spread everywhere. Uh, and now Washington and Oregon, it's been reported there. So the only states that have not yet had human cases are Alaska, Hawaii, and Maine. And Maine has got it in the mosquito populations. So this, is, this is shows how rapidly these viruses can spread if they've got a mobile vector, like a bird. Is the question? What, Venezuelan? West Nile, I can't tell you the number of cases, but it's growing in Canada, and Canada have got a... I, I would have to look that up for you. Mexico, I'm not sure how many cases there are in Mexico at all. Uh, but it certainly has spread into Canada. But not to the number that we've been having here at the moment. But then every year, you know, the surprise is which state gets the huge amounts. This year it's Idaho. Um, we don't know why Idaho has got so many. Uh, but there's something like, uh, uh, it's a huge number of cases in one small county, which has got Boise in it, which may be because most people in Idaho live in Boise, but... Any other questions? So, yes, it's obviously spreading over the border, and we don't really know of a way to control it. It infects a lot of different birds, many of which it kills, but um, many of which apparently it doesn't. Um, and so there's no way you can stop the spread of this thing. So once we've got it, we apparently have got it. So what are the symptoms? Um, when you get a clinical case, uh, the... the the symptoms include fever, which is, as I say, a, a general response. Probably a lot of this is interferon-mediated. But it can get into the brain. And of course, it's circulating in the blood. It can grow in endothelial cells. That gives it an obvious way to get across the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and so you get meningitis and encephalitis, and these can be serious and can be fatal. So the symptoms include all the symptoms you would expect from meningitis or encephalitis. Uh, more rarely, you can get an acute flaccid paralysis, which is basically poliomyelitis. Polio means gray, and myelo means um, bone marrow, so what's inside the bone. So, of course, for your spinal column, it's your spinal cord. So poliomyelitis means infection of the gray matter of the spinal cord, inflammation. Uh, so this is, was, originally CDC was calling it West Nile poliomyelitis. Um, I noticed that in some of their recent news releases, they're starting to call it poliomyelitis-like syndrome, and I think they're doing that so that the public doesn't get confused as to poliovirus caused my poliomyelitis versus West Nile cause. Uh, but basically, the symptoms are the same, and you can also get the it affecting the, the you can get the equivalent of ball bar polio, and this can be really serious if they're not immediately put onto some kind of automatic breathing system. It can be terrible. So this is rare, but at the moment we don't know, we don't have good figures for it. So unfortunately I can't give you good figures, but meningitis and encephalitis are much more common. So we do have some figures here. For about every 150 people infected, about 30 will get mild symptoms, and many of these will never see a physician. So you'll never know about most of these 30, but a few uh, may feel sufficiently bad, particularly if they get a rash. Um, that they uh, may go and see a physician, and then they may be diagnosed. So there's a lot of maize in here. But of these 30, a few will be reported as having West Nile fever. Um, but then about one out of 150 will get much more severe illness, which will include encephalitis and meningitis and very high fever, the things that you would go to a physician for. Uh, and that's accompanied by things like stiff neck, stupor, coma, tremors, convulsions, uh, due to the uh, encephalitis. Uh, the frequency of the flaccid paralysis, as I say, is unknown. It's much less frequent than the encephalitis, but it's there. And frequently, the people with that flaccid paralysis uh, 
do not know, uh, they don't have these other symptoms. So it's not a case of, oh, you've got a patient with encephalitis and they're getting this poliomyelitis-like syndrome. You have patients with the poliomyelitis and they're not showing any other symptoms. So the case fatality ratio, it's somewhere around 3 to 7%. At the moment, it's running about 4%. Obviously, the case fatality ratio depends on how readily we recognize that a real case is a real case, um, as well as the effectiveness of treatment. Uh, but it's much higher in the, in the elderly, and most fatalities are over 50 years of age. So uh, that's as opposed to the uh, Toga viruses, I would cause, where, where children are often t uh, at the highest risk. Transmission, I've already said, by the mosquito. Now, you can transmit this virus by blood transfusion. Now, I've already said the human is a dead-end host, and that means you don't get enough viremia to participate in the cycle with the mosquito. Uh, but the mosquito normally doesn't suck a pint of blood when it takes a meal. In a pint of blood, you can have enough virus to infect somebody else. So... If we had mosquitoes that did suck a pint of blood, and you may think you've met some of them, but if we did have mosquitoes that sucked a pint of blood, um, then they may get an infected as well. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, we do have a rather more significant viremia, which maybe lasts for a rather longer time than we seem to have got with some of these other viruses. And so the blood supply has been the cause of transmission of this virus, and it's now screened. So the blood supply is screened by a PCR test to look for viral RNA so that you can detect the virus. You know, they're not looking for the antibody response. That's going to be too late by and large. You, you want to look for the virus. So the blood, transfusion, the blood supply is now screened. So, uh, but we've had um, hundreds of cases of uh, infected blood donors this, this year alone in many states. Um, and it has been transmitted by organ donation. And, of course, one of the problems there is um, the recipient is going to be immune suppressed. So you, uh, it may be that very few people who are infected by the regular route show symptoms, but it seems when you're infected by the organ donation route, um, you're much more likely to show symptoms, presumably because your immune suppression uh, creates big problems. But just to show this is just the number of cases over the last few years, the hope was that when we saw these 4,000 in 2002 and 10,000 almost in 2003, that this thing would burn itself out. There would be so much um, antibody resistant in the human population and the animal population that this would just burn itself out. But that hasn't occurred. Um, and so we are, not, we, we are still seeing appreciable transmission. And this year is, is the highest for the last couple of years. So it really hasn't died out as yet. Um, people keep hoping, but it hasn't happened. And last year, the case fatality rate was about 4%. And this figure for this year, we still got more cases that will be coming in. So that's West Nile. Are there any questions on West Nile? For that? The second is commonest is, uh, arbovirus um, in this country is St. Louis encephalitis. Um, and, but far fewer cases than West Nile. Uh, the reservoir, again, is birds, and again, man is usually a dead-end host. Um, the vector is the mosquito. Uh, very few infections are clinical. This is basically all the same that you've seen with West Nile. It's a flavivirus, again, just like West Nile is. Um, the elderly are at higher risk, again, just like West Nile. And the case fatality rate is around 3 to 25%. Uh, that seems a huge range. And one of the things is um, there was an outbreak of this in Florida some years ago, uh, and the 25% came from one of these, uh, what a friend of mine calls Costa Geriatrica. You know, one, it was some county in Florida where, where virtually everybody was a retiree. The few counties over where there was a much younger average age of population, the case fatality rate was much lower. So some of this reflects if you've got a population that is selected for being elderly, you'll see a much higher case fatality rate. And any questions on St. Louis? Because basically these are kind of, as I say, they're much the same thing. But you do need to know for things like St. Louis, West Nile, equine encephalitis, you, you need to know the age that's at risk and the vectors. <coughs> uh, California serogroup encephalitis is associated with the Bunya virus family. Uh, and it's a whole big group of viruses with umpteen names. 
but it includes lacrosse, and recently lacrosse has been the major problem in that. Um, and it's recently much common, commoner in the eastern US, and it's a reservoir of small animals, things like chipmunks, squirrels, etc. Uh, and children at much higher risk. So, in fact, the CDC site has got little slideshows for kindergarten children so that they learn about mosquitoes and one thing and another. Uh, with Nito Mosquito, if you want anything that's going to be fun on. I don't know what. <laughs> but anyway, it's got a fairly low ca case fatality rate, but it is children who are at risk for this encephalitis, and it's about 80 cases a year. Um, one thing I didn't mention with the equine encephalitis, the people who recover from that encephalitis frequently have got um, serious sequelae, so it, it's, it has major problems. Uh, I think the sequelae are much less serious with um, so this just shows the cycle. Human again is dead end. Any questions? Okay. Um, so uh, now I want to move up to the arboviruses, which um, the typical things, as I say, they all cause fever, but the typical things are really high fever uh, uh, and, uh, and hemorrhagic fever. Uh, and the, the viruses I'm particularly going to focus on here are dengue and yellow fever. Um, there is a virus that causes something called Colorado tick fever. Uh, that's not terribly important. It's a Rio virus. It sometimes appears on the, uh, these tests. Uh, it's sometimes called Colti virus, C-O-L for Colorado, T-I for tick. Um, it causes a rash, and it frequently isn't diagnosed. But if the rash is serious, it can be misread for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And the important thing is to treat as if Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Don't say, oh, this may just be a minor um, rear virus infection. Unless you know it's not Rocky Mountain spotted fever, you, you need to take. So it may be included in the differential diagnosis, but you certainly treat Rocky Mountain spotted fever very, very seriously. So it's a mild disease in man. Probably very common, probably rarely reported. The remaining two I want to talk about are dengue and yellow fever. They're both viruses. Um, they both cause major illness worldwide. Both of them were major causes of epidemics in this country for many years. And in fact, if you read about the founding fathers in Philadelphia at the beginning, they're leaving Philadelphia because there's a dengue epidemic. They're leaving Philadelphia because there's a yellow fever epidemic. Yellow fever was known as the scourge of the South during the Civil War in that period. If you read tales of Memphis, St. New Orleans, Galveston, Charleston, Philadelphia, all of these cities suffered from both of these viruses. So these were serious here. They, now we are free of endemic dengue and endemic yellow fever, uh, and a lot of that is due to public health and due to careful controls about re-importing it, because both of these have an urban cycle. So in both of these, humans can be a major part of the cycle. So dengue and yellow fever by the way, have a jungle cycle, um, which is monkeys to mosquitoes, uh, which is not a problem in this country, but the urban cycle, it man to mosquitoes, is. So in this country, it can be kept going by the urban cycle. It's a rapidly increasing disease in the tropics. It's spreading everywhere. One thing is because mosquito controls, which were common in the 60s and 70s, have gradually been dropped, uh, and mosquitoes are coming up, but also because for reasons we don't know, but for increased travel and things like that, and also for increased presence of humans in, in forests and those kind of environments. Uh, we see several hundred cases a year in this country due to people who come in from infected countries. Uh, you have like an eight to 10 day infection uh, incubation period, so people can be infected elsewhere, come back and not know they're infected until after they arrive back. And we get occasional cases where people who've never been out of the country get it, uh, and we're fairly sure that's because they've been bitten by a mosquito in this urban cycle, uh, and the original person was never discovered. So the import case was never discovered. But real riot, there's millions of cases. Um, the, the typical symptoms are fever, headache, retroorbital pain, myalgia, arthralgia, interferon. Bone ache, it's known as bone, breakbone fever in many parts of the world. There's sometimes a rash. It can look like a lot of other things, uh, and you can occasionally get an encephalitis with it. So it's frequently not reported because it looks like something else and you don't know that you've got it. 
Um, the break bone fever is really bad and, and sort of terrible pain. Uh, and actually, for many people afterwards, there's also a major depression. And somebody said it should also be called break heart fever. Uh, but this is what you typically see, and most people recover. It's not, but you can get a complication of this called dengue hemorrhagic fever or demohedragic shock, when what happens is it really gets going in, and the endothelial cells start dying, um, leaking, you get hemorrhages, you get plasma leakage, um, you get hemoconcentration because of the plasma leakage, you get hypertension, circulatory failure, shock. So the end part is the shock, the beginning part is the hemorrhagic fever. Uh, you can have major hemorrhages or more minor hemorrhages. The lungs can fill with fluid, and this shows just how much fluid is in this lung here. And why do you get it? And one of the arguments is that there are four serotypes of dengue. This makes it very difficult to develop a vaccine, uh, because one thing is, the idea is if you've got an antibody to one serotype and then you're infected with another serotype, the antibody is not neutralizing, but it will bind to the virus. So your macrophages will take it up by their FC receptors, and they, this, these viruses like to grow in macrophages unusually. And so the virus, you get a far higher uptake of the virus. It's being carried by the body in the macrophages. Uh, and you get this hemorrhagic fever as a consequence of this um, in, infection of the macrophages. And one idea is the macrophages become activated. They release all these cytokines, vasodilation substances, etc., etc. And a lot of this can be the consequence of the macrophage. So one of the reasons why we're seeing a lot more dengue hemorrhagic fever at the moment is because the serotypes at one stage, each part of the world seemed to just have one or maybe two serotypes. But with travel and everything, now you're seeing all of these serotypes worldwide. And so it's this business about being exposed to more than one uh, serotype is, is getting much more common. And one thing to remember is with infants, they can go down with den dengue hemorrhagic fever and on their first apparent infection with dengue. And it's thought in that case, it could be that if the mother's got antibodies to a different serotype, you get the same immune enhancement due to this binding of the antibodies, but not being able to neutralize the virus. So children tend to get more severe disease. Um, you give, you can only sort of treat uh, the symptoms, um, but you don't give aspirin because it can have an anticoagulant effect with, with, and you've already got bleeding, so you don't want any more. Uh, and the case fatality rate, if, if, a, if you're prepared for this and realize what you've got, then fluid replacement can prevent a lot of the fatality. So if you don't realize what you've got or there's no access to fluid re replacement, uh, then the, the case fatality rate can be very high. Uh, but if you've got good medical care, you can reduce it to 1%. But that, that means knowing what you've got, responding rapidly, and treating accordingly. But this shows 1981, dengue hemorrhagic fever had not been seen in the Americas. Dengue had, but not the hemorrhagic fever. 1981, 2003, all of these countries now have dengue hemorrhagic fever. And just quickly, if I can just have a couple of minutes, yellow fever, again, another flavivirus. This is the virus that flaviviruses were named after. Because in South America and in Africa, uh, it has a jungle and an urban cycle. So here, people can be exposed due to either, but it can be imported into this country and establish an urban cycle because we can be a major part of that cycle. And again, you get hemorrhages, you get degeneration of the liver and the kidney and the heart. This is a really serious thing. And the case fatality rate can be 50%. And in addition to which, um, although there are subclinical cases of yellow fever, um, you can actually have a rather higher percentage of the population come up with serious symptoms than with most of these other viruses. So I talked about uh, Galveston, uh, New Orleans. They both had major epidemics where 10% of the population died from yellow fever. Um, the one I mentioned uh, where Washington and co. left town uh, at the advice of a, an eminent physician, um, that had a case fatality rate of 5%. So even as far north as that, it was a major problem. So um, this is really nasty. And the important thing to, for you to consider 
is one, if you get a case, it should be reported. Um, and again, public health things. One thing is with many of these, the symptoms, are, uh, you get a viremia at the stage, same stage of the symptoms. So protecting the patient from mosquito bites can interrupt the transmission cycle. That can be really important in these kind of things. But there is a vaccine for yellow fever. It's an attenuated virus. It was established like 30 years ago. There are a few, very, very few cases it's been realized recently um, with some side effects. But the vast majority of people, it's been an excellent vaccine. So there is a vaccine. So if you've got any people in your office who are going to these kind of areas, they should be vaccinated against yellow fever unless there's some reason not to. Uh, but at the very least, they should be warned about these problems. Every year we see people, import, it's imported because people either didn't know that they should have yellow fever vaccine or didn't bother to take it. Um, you need to be very careful. Uh, but in view of the fact that there are very rare side consequences, you don't want to vaccinate everyone. You, you vaccinate those who are likely to be at risk. Sorry about the rush, but is that okay? Any questions? Thank you for coming. I hope the exam goes really well. <laughs> Thank you.